So I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers now, and then each speaker will have approximately 10 minutes. Uh, so r r gather up your questions, remember what you wanted to ask them, and, and then at the end we'll, we'll open into a discussion. So, but first I'll just introduce the speakers. I'm Oriel Kenny, I work in uh, PAGE in Leeds Beckett, um, and I'm the chair. We have Nat Nkube, who's the founder and director of the Global Native. This is an organisation of African diaspora, first years, we were talking about diaspora this week, um, who support farmers in rural Zimbabwe. And now was born in Zimbabwe, but has lived in Leeds for 10 years. And then we have here Connor Walsh, who is from the Real Junk Food Project, which I've also promoted with my students. Um, so he was involved in the founding of the Real Junk Food Project, which has a physical presence in a very bright blue cafe in Armley in January last year while he was still doing his degree and he graduated. I remember asking you once about your dissertation, you had it all in hand. He graduated in geography from the University of Leeds just up the road. And I can't really read the rest. <laughs> um, so he's been active in campaigning and uh, also on environmental issues. And he's the co-director of the Real Junk Food Project now and uh, also works part-time at the University of Leeds in, oh, the velo, the bike, bicycle thing. Yeah. And then we have Simon Holland, who is here with two hats on, which is Feed Leeds and Barefoot Lightning. He's going to tell you about the second one. So he's got a background in strategy con consulting before he uh, changed careers to apply his knowledge to problems in developing and emerging economies. Um, so he started by working with a number of NGOs in Latin America who were supplying organic food to Europe and he became aware of the uh, kind of uh, disconnect in information flows between farmers to NGOs and agribusiness and vice versa. Um, He's had various prestigious appointments, like being a committee member for IT and Agriculture for the Planning Commission of India and uh, the National Pest and Disease Surveillance System. Um, and he's n his now focus is on farmers and knowledge and decision making. And finally, we have Tim Ward, who is the chair of the Local World Development Movement Group in Leeds. Um, his background's in politics and economics, but he's worked for long he worked for a long time in health services. Um, his um, management is now retired, so he can devote more time to WDM, and he's also on a committee with um, for dementia care through his local church. So that's our speakers very briefly, but they're uh, going to tell you much more about their perspective now. So can I call on Na to just start? And you guys can stay or you can go. <coughs> Good evening. Hello. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for a bit more. Uh, well, thank you, Oriel, for the introduction. As she stated, I'm from a small charity based here in Leeds called The Global Native. And when I saw the flag for the talk, it has something about think global, act local. And I thought, oh, that's us. That's what we're trying to do at any rate. So you can judge me after I've given the talk about how well we're doing that. The Global Native works with farmers in Zimbabwe. I hope I'm loud enough. We work with small scale rural farmers in Zimbabwe. And when we started, we had the silly problem of starving farmers. Now, it doesn't make sense that farmers on the land were starving, but that's the situation that we had. Compounded, of course, by the general poverty and, and all the other issues that we were facing. So we spent, I think, probably the whole of the first year just thinking about the problem and thinking, what is poverty? Now, I'm sure there's a few people here who can give a whole range of answers, but we circled on a much simpler one, I hope. A lot of times, poverty is seen as something lacking. It's always about a lack. Something is not there. And the way you define it sort of leads to how you're going to respond. So something is lacking, you're going to give something. So there's a lot of giving around poverty. A lot of, it's not there, so we're going to ship it over or do whatever. And we looked at this and we thought, 
I grew up in Zimbabwe. I grew up in a very poor village, actually, in Zimbabwe. And we didn't think we were poor. I mean, Africa is not poor. If you look at the statistics, Africa is the richest continent in the world. But the Africans are poor at the minute. So what is the problem? And when we looked at it and thought about it, we came up with the, what we believe is the, is the situation that it's not about something is lacking, but there has been a loss. Something has been lost. When we have people who are poor in an environment that is that rich, why are they failing to thrive? Something has been lost. And we, we believe poverty is not a lack. It's a loss of capacity. It's a loss of the ability to thrive in a particular environment. And we started looking at that about how, how did that loss happen? How did so many people lose their ability to do well? And our belief is that this loss comes through it's not a natural thing. No one is born poor. But somehow along the way, something is lost and that comes through man-made systems. There are a lot of systems that suck the <laughs> strength or the ability out of people's, uh, their ability to do some good, to do something for themselves, to, to thrive. And we believe that a lot of the reason behind these systems, the way they end up that skewed, is a power issue. Or more accurately, a concentration power issue. When power is concentrated in particular hands, you end up with a skew to who thrives and who doesn't thrive. So for me, when I started doing the work that I do, I looked at where did it go wrong and how did it happen and go to the conclusion that something was lost through power structures that made it difficult for certain sectors of, of society to do well for themselves. And when you look at it that way, the responses that then you need to come up with are a little bit different to what we have got a lot of in Africa. I'm, I'm not against any NGO or anything, but a lot of things haven't worked because the way things have been defined and followed through haven't actually had the right impact. So if the issue is systems and structures and power concentration, how do you change that? I think one of the most popular ones is revolution. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually not, I'm a total pacifist, so there I, I am not one of the, I, I, I don't feel, I mean, if you look at the Zimbabwe situation, if you ask our president right now, he'll tell you the land change system that's been going on over the past 10 years, there's been a revolution, and he sees it in those terms. I'm a bit wary of revolution because you, you can't always control this thing once it starts running and you can't always tell what sort of um, externalities we'll have with it. I think there is another way. And for me that way is cooperation, choosing to cooperate at whatever level. Hopefully it has a few less externalities and hopefully it has better outcomes. What we do as the global nature is about cooperation on a local and global scale with farmers <coughs> in Zimbabwe. Now, I, I need a pen in my hands. I, I need to talk and write. Sorry to, to get all lecturing around you. But we have farmers. This is the average poor farmer in Zimbabwe. And the average rural Zimbabwe farmer has access to at least, owns at least five hectares of land. Now, if I owned five hectares of land in certain parts of the world, like Manhattan, <laughs> <laughs> I would be a millionaire. But these guys own that, and generally they would have another 10 or so hectares for grazing. Or, so they have a lot of access to, to natural resources. But they are not able to make a living from that. Sometimes they're not even able to feed themselves from that. What we believe is needs to be done in terms of cooperating here. We have what would be charitable, really, organizations on one hand and business on the other. The reason we're working across this is that to get these guys here to up their game, as it were, we need someone to enhance their capacity. If you remember, I said there's been a loss, and you're talking about a loss of capacity, loss of the ability to do things. So these 
organizations enhance the farmer's capacity to produce at a particular level. So you're talking things like mobilization, you're talking things like training, you're talking things like follow-up of the farmers, or anything that will get them to move from zero tons per hectare to five, ten, whatever it is they need. Once they get to a particular level of production and it's beyond what they need to survive, you're talking excess now, you're talking markets now, you can start to trade. And effectively, you're starting to talk business. So on this side, you've got businesses providing services like inputs, logistics. These guys are providing a service. I know it's business, but it must be about service provision to these people in the middle. It's not for free. They pay for the service but business needs to understand they are providing them a service. The missing link in all this is the money. Who funds this? Who makes this all happen and come together? And this is where quite a, a lot of the cooperation is coming from. What the Global Native has done is set up an IPS to issue community shares. This gives us an opportunity to fund the work from a very broad base of people who put in anything from 25 pounds to 20,000 pounds. And it can be members of the Zimbabwean diaspora, it can be a local investor, it can be anybody who has a heart for this change here to happen. But more importantly, the farmers themselves invest in themselves. Before they can start working with the business, they need to raise the investment. Now that might sound like a ridiculous idea. When you see the pictures of the farmers that I deal with, most of them have a hut or two and a couple of chickens and some cows. But the area I come from is known for cow ranching. I'm Debele, that's my tribe. And my tribe are very big about cows. I mean, it's the big thing. Debele men must own a cow. So all of, most of them will have five, eight, maybe. And what we do is we go to them and say, if you send two cows, you'll raise about a thousand dollars. And if you invest that in cash crop production, like tomatoes, you will make anything from six to about 12,000, depending on the market price. Now, I'm going to end, I don't know if I still have a bit of time, to end with a story, two minutes, to illustrate what we're doing. So last September, when I was in Zimbabwe, we met with a farmer who is about 60 or so, he's never really farmed, but he, he owns all this land and, and he's, he's in need of the assistance. So he went in through this, received the training, received all the support, and once he knew what he was doing, he was led to the guys where he gets his inputs and all that. If I tell you in his first season, he did, I think, 18 or so thousand tons of tomatoes, 18 tons of tomatoes, 80,000 kgs, and he made something like 11, 11 or 12,000 US dollars. This is like from zero. But with that support and all the cooperation that comes through, you are able to move somebody here from literally very little money to 10,000 in one season. If you look at most of the research and all, they'll tell you that's not possible. And to be honest, this guy was exceptional. But for me, it proves what is possible. Most of them are going to do half of what he did. But even half of that for somebody where the, the, the average income for the year is 500 US dollars is a huge jump. And that is only possible through a lot of cooperation by a lot of people in very different areas. One of the things we do here is the diaspora, once we raise the money, we send in transport trucks to them. So this guy is able to do his tomatoes, a truck is there, he takes them to the market, he makes the money, the business makes their money, and we who invested here get a bit of the, of, of the interest back, and everybody benefits, and I, I'm hoping we're truly creating a virtuous circle. I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Can people hear me at the back? Yeah. 
Um, so I'm just going <coughs> to give a, a really brief introduction to the Real Junk Food Project and then kind of then tie it into how it fits into these themes of global agriculture and our global food system. So the Royal Drug Food Project started last December, December, 9, December 16th to be precise, so it's coming up to our one year anniversary. Um, and what this cafe is, what it does and what it relies <coughs> upon is, is food waste. Um, so you're probably aware that there's you know, masses of food waste wasted each year, just in the UK, 15 million tonnes. Um, and we, we as a cafe use only, only food waste and then serve it on a pay field basis. So we, we started off from, yeah, back, back in December we were getting food from, food from one or two sources across Leeds. Suma actually, who people might be aware of, who are wholesalers in Halifax, they were one of our first supporters and I still supporting us now. Um, but from starting off with this idea of there's all this food going to waste, what are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to open a cafe, we're only going to use food waste and it's and the way we the way we kind of sell it, or the way we price it up, is on a pay you feel basis. And that's just a simple, let's make it accessible for everyone and let's forget about money for you know in our little in our little cafe. Um, so yeah, what does this what does it have to do with our what does our cafe in Armley have to do with the global food system? Uh, you know, when I was when I was putting that question to myself, I thought mm, maybe not very much. Um, but of course it does because you know the food it is a global food system that we're in. And there's an anecdote which I'm going to tell, which I think actually illustrates it quite well and illustrates our cafe and how we kind of came to be. Um, but very much in our early days of opening the cafe, our we weren't getting food like we are now. It's not like we had restaurants or supermarkets or other cafes coming up to us and say, hey, I've not used this this week, it's still fine, I'm not gonna use it, but you can. So the way we went about getting food was to go to supermarkets, to go behind the supermarkets, to find their bins and take the food. It was it was simple, it was like, well, there's a, there's a source of food, we need it, it's still fine, it's still edible, it's still safe, it's still clean, all of that. Um, and yeah, as we were starting up, we had a, one of our supermarkets that we went to, which is a bit out, out in Otley, um, for weeks on end we were getting up to 40, 50, 60 avocados. And these are pre-packaged avocados in a you know, little polystyrene box of two with a plastic, you know, plastic wrapper and then wrapped in cling film. And there's maybe 40, 50 in the bin each time we go there, which is maybe twice a week. And these avocados, which are grown halfway around the world, kind of, you know, shipped or flown to England to then sat, sit on a supermarket shelf to then go in a bin. And the thing about all of this is these are, every week these avocados were always needed to, they weren't even ripe yet, but they're on the shelf, you can only have, you know, food on the shelf for so long and, you know, just, you know, if we're talking about a global food system and what's wrong with it, well, you know, well, that there is a massive, like, you know, opens up your eyes actually what we're we doing, you know, growing this food around the world, you know, different, you know, other end of the world for it to be shipped on a supermarket shelf to then end up in a bin. Luckily, yeah, we were there to, to, to stop that going to waste. Um, okay, and then, so yeah, that's kind of, that's part of, you know, us, the global food system interacting with the local in our main, um, kind of, and then kind of moving moving on into kind of some of the themes about the cafe and why is it what what's significant about the cafe in yeah this kind of global food system um, and I I've, I've I've called it for kind of food inequality and the kind of with the way our pay as you feel concept interacts with food and the, the one of the reasons there's many reasons why we adopted the pay as you feel concept and it's a to make it accessible to everyone and it's also about Let's forget about money. Let's what can people give in their you know their time, their resources, their skills, rather than having to give a financial contribution. Um, it's about you know taking money out of that transaction. It's kind of kind of going back to a barter economy, but it's slightly different. But one of the things that I really like about the pay as you feel concept is our cafe isn't marketed towards anyone. If you go into Leeds City Centre, every restaurant is trying to attract a certain type of person by the prices on its menu. It's you know. Is it's it's the same you know the fine dining restaurant is is wants a certain type of person to come in 
you know, the cheap and cheerful takeaway is probably expecting it to a different demographic of people to, to come in. And it's the same on the high street with the shops. If you, if you go around Armley, you won't find fresh fruit or veg. You'll find frozen foods. You'll find any, like, you know, you know what I'm kind of getting at is there's one type of food for one person and one type of food for the other. And it does come down to, does come down to price it at the, end of the, at the end of the day. But it's, it's kind of, it's framing food in a certain way for a certain type of person, which is significant to us as well because we're dealing with food waste. And currently the narrative with food waste has always been, when other organisations have worked with food waste in the past, they've always done good work. People like Fair Share, who are a food distribution um, company, they distribute food that's kind of gone to waste by supermarkets or wholesalers or whomever. And you also have organisations like Food Cycle, both of whom deal with food waste. They stop it going to waste, they redistribute it. But it's always framed under the food waste is always framed as this is food that's past its best, therefore it's for people who can't afford food that's in date. Um, it's always been targeted, food waste has always been targeted towards homeless shelters, refugee centres, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, which is great in itself, but you're framing food waste as food which is not fit for people who can't afford food and it's for people who, who haven't got access to healthy, nutritious, nutritious food. And we think as a, you know, if we're there to stop food waste, if we're there to end food waste, if we constantly see it as, well actually, we kind of need food, food waste because it's there for the people who have no access to food on the high street. Well, what we're saying is, no, this food is fine, there's enough of it for everyone, there's enough, you know, there's enough food wasted annually to feed, to feed the UK, it's maybe not completely, but we've just worked on, on our figures, I think, on what we've converted our 20 tonnes of food that we've saved, which is a drop in the ocean compared to 15 million tonnes annually, is we've fed up to yeah, 10,000 people that are 20,000 20, tonnes. And if you were to kind of scale that up to the UK's food waste, it would work out at, I think it's about, I think it's three meals a day, I think it's three meals a day, um, for every person in the UK for 100 days or one meal a day for the whole population. So a significant amount of food. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the perceptions of food waste. We all, a lot of people already have perceptions of food waste and what we're trying to say is actually this shouldn't be waste, this shouldn't be thrown out, we should be thinking about it differently. And as we feel as using it in a cafe, having this cafe there and accessible to everyone, you know, we're not saying this is for this is for people who, who can't afford to write and eat or people who can't afford to go to the shops. This is just there's enough food there. Why can't it, why can't everyone have it? Um, now the fact we're in army is is by the by that's where that's where we could get a cafe. It wasn't we didn't choose to go to army. Kind of army chose us. You know, these cafes could be in Chapel Allerton, Headingley, Hare Hills, anywhere in Leeds because a there's enough food to go around and b if you're going to change the perceptions of food waste, you've got to feed it to everyone. You've got to show everyone, actually, this is, this is insane. We, should, we shouldn't be wasting this much. Um, and we've, we feel that's kind of how we're challenging that by not framing food waste <coughs> as food for people who can't, who can't afford food that's in day, basically. Um, yeah. And as we're kind of, I'm sure, the, the rest of... Um, the rest of the speakers will talk about kind of different challenges that are faced, <coughs> the challenges of farmers in Zimbabwe and not being able to feed themselves. There's a lot of uh, the kind of there's a, a certain amount of rhetoric in the UK about um, kind of we just need to you know we just need to teach people you know how to you know how to cook up a, a vegetable stew or need to people know how to you know go back to basics with food, which is all correct and we're we're trying to do that, but to say that you know people's problems with food just relate to food is I think is, is wrong. It is if having kind of worked and lived in army for the last few years you, you realise it's not, you know, people's basic knowledge of food is, is pretty low and, you know, regularly we have people who come in don't know what a courgette is or don't know what a aubergine is or don't know how to make a fruit salad. Um, and obviously challenging that, you know, going and kind of challenging that is a big thing, but there's also, you know, it's multi layered problems in army. There's there's yeah, several problems, and it's not just about trying to teach people how to cook, it's about giving people 
giving, getting people into work and getting people off drugs and alcohol and kind of giving them support and services that they need to actually be able to go and have a life where they can cook and they can learn to cook and they can support themselves. It's not just simply a case of making sure people shop at the co-op rather than Iceland. Um, and these are all challenges we, that we face kind of day by day. Um, last little moving on kind of to the future. Um, what we're trying to do as the Real Drug Food Project is to abolish food waste. We wanted it to happen yesterday. We're not here to, we're here to put ourselves out of business, which in the kind of, can, can be a, in the kind of charitable sector, although we're not a charity, we're, we are a business, um, a community interest company, so the profits go back into the business. But um, as, a, as a business, we want to put ourselves out of business. We want an end to food waste. And, you know, there's a line about you know do charities always want an end to poverty because it you know might then put them out put them out of work but we are firmly of the belief that you know food waste should have stopped yesterday we don't want to be here we want to be getting on and you know change, changing other things um, and how we do that you know we change hearts and minds change the perceptions of food waste get supermarkets on board because you know, supermarkets don't like waste um, but they're not gonna they're not going to go against their business practices overnight to suddenly give us all their food. Um, particularly as us as ourselves as a business and not a charity. Um, and yeah, changing many things. Uh, the one thing which we're aiming for, which we think we can really change, which is best before dates on food. Best before dates on food, which are on the majority of things. Your dried goods, your tin goods, stuff that's not in the fridge, but you know, and generally lasts for a good few months in the pudding good few months in the cupboard. Currently there's no law to say that that food should be thrown out, um, but currently it's a retailer's recommendation that if it's gone past its best before date, it should be chucked. And we want to, we think it's possible and we want to do it is to get a law in there saying that's, that's illegal. And that actually I think is achievable in the next few years. The bigger one is used by dates, which is meat, fish and dairy, um, which also carries a health warning. But I just read the other day, the, you're as likely to die from food poisoning in the UK as you are to be struck by lightning. Um, and we're, this is, yeah, that's the cause of you know, millions of tonnes of food that goes to waste every day. Perfectly good edible food. Now there is risks with some foods, but we're asking that for that to be looked at and, and changed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope I'm speaking into the right microphone. Um, as Oriel mentioned, uh, my name is Tim Ward and uh, I'm part of the World Development Local Group which meets here on a monthly basis in Leeds, which is indeed a part of the wider World Development Group. And I've just jotted down a title that I want to talk about uh, campaigning on global and local food systems and talk about some of the uh, issues and some of the ways in which WDM campaigns and it'd be interesting to have some feedback on that when we come to the discussion at, at the end. Um, just starting at points that I know may well be familiar with, with many people, um, that there is, uh, there is a problem uh, in, the, in the global food system and that there is connections between the global food system and local food systems as um, the example of avocados Travelling thousands of miles and then going to waste uh, was illustrated. Um, the fact is that there are large numbers in sub Saharan Africa and throughout the world still hungry or malnourished. One figure is one in three in sub Saharan Africa, and the regularly quoted figure of about a billion malnourished or 800, 800 million throughout the world. At the same time, there's an equivalent number uh, of obese people. Uh, in the world. So the, there's, a, there's an issue of there being enough food in the world, but problems of distribution at both ends of the spectrum. Now WDM will contend that part of the uh, reasoning behind that and part of the solutions are political, um, but political can be locally uh, effective and also needs to be nationally and internationally effective. Um, so what we try and do is take that, those thoughts and from a Leeds WDM point of view, try and see if we can apply them um, in a local way. And I've just put uh, some very brief examples of the kind of things 
uh, that we have done, um, including, um, I don't know if it's possible to, to point, but including uh, having a, a board game at Chapel Allerton uh, Arts Festival, which tried to illustrate speculation on food and how people bet on the price of food and make money for that, from that and do that at the expense of poor people. We tried similarly to, to uh, show how government policies, as we'll come on to, can affect uh, the ability of Africa, African, the many African nations to feed themselves. Uh, we helped to sponsor a conference uh, called Whose Food Are Food, which is really relating to uh, what was going on in Leeds. Uh, Simon may mention some of these activities a bit later, but there are many groups uh, trying to address the issue of uh, food in Leeds and trying to get more sustainable food policy, both locally as well as globally. Uh, at the same time, um, in, based in London and in Edinburgh, uh, World Development Movement as a whole tries to, to raise issues perhaps at um, another level through, for example, uh, the production of detailed reports, uh, the most current one being the Carving Up a Continent one, which I hope you can see, which is about uh, food in Africa and government policy towards it. Uh, and it believes that influencing people also has to take uh, uh, a way in which uh, makes an impact. Uh, and so for campaigners went to RBS uh, and not literally, but many of them were feeding themselves with oil, which was to highlight the, the addiction of banks to fossil fuels and mining of fossil fuels. Um, you'll see there uh, some of the problems uh, of the kind of current market, uh, as WDM sees it laid out, um, that the international grain trade that is controlled by a very, very small number of countries, which can have a very big impact on um, individual countries, uh, and that one of the resulting uh, policies of land grabs uh, affects the size of Western Europe. Um, and we talked about Barclays and their involvement in food speculation. So again, this slide again, basically what that, it, the impacts of all of this tend to be on uh, individuals throughout areas of the world have a loss, and that loss, as now was um, explaining, means they cannot uh, get out of a vicious circle which condemns them to poverty. Um, one of the further examples which people are going to be familiar with is the extent to which um, an industrial farming model uh, is reliant on pesticides which then can destroy the long-term um, future of farms and crops. Um, in a nutshell, um, the food system in the world is not fair, there's not a level playing field, it's biased towards the rich countries uh, who have, if you like, power and against the uh, um, developing or poorer countries uh, who do not have the power. Um, one of the things in particular um, that's happening at the moment is the government is, sees the, the way to feed Africa is through uh, reliance on a thing called the New Alliance, which uh, involves all the big companies represented here, uh, as well as certain African countries and uh, banks and it relies on a policy of large-scale uh, agriculture as being the solution to Africa's food problems uh, because it will raise production, whereas it will not necessarily uh, lead to the benefits of that going to the small-scale farmer and consumer. Um, a slide. Um, there has been uh, improvements or which is the black line, the underneath line, some improvements in food production uh, in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 10 or so years. But at the same time, undernutrition has increased. So again, we contend that the issues are ones of access, not ones of production. Uh, access to food and access to markets, not one of production of food. Um, very briefly, I mentioned uh, the fact that uh, land grabbing, which is going on, people from these parts of the world be well aware of uh, the way that land rights in particular countries are very weak uh, and therefore it's easy for governments and corporations 
or the two acting together to, to get control over areas ostensibly for uh, crops, but again to the detriment of the people that were living there. Uh, controlling seeds uh, is a very uh, high profile issue, um, but the more the industrial model of agriculture pervades, uh, the more the model will be that the, the companies concerned uh, control the seeds and the biodiversity therefore is reduced in the control of individual farmers likewise. Um, export crops is saying there's something wrong if people are just farming in poorer countries to produce exports for richer countries. And what's happening is that in a big scale there are various growth corridors in parts of Africa uh, designed just to do just that. Um, there are policies to uh, uh, affect that. Uh, one, um, this is a slide of the Via Campesina, which is a movement in, uh, based in, in uh, Latin America originally, but is one of the, there has to be some form of uh, resistance. Uh, but how to work that through is, is, is obviously a big issue. Uh, that's a, a further slide about the Via Campesina. Um, food sovereignty, sorry that's so detailed, I won't dwell onto that because that's perhaps another conversation. Uh, but it's basically saying there has to be some underlying principles of how uh, agriculture and food is managed, not just in certain countries but throughout the world, to have some kind of local uh, and democratic control that isn't just about food consumers but is also about uh, food providers and links those together. And as Nara was saying, there's some kind of growth and sharing of technologies and knowledge together. Um, this is uh, an example of uh, Mali, where the food sovereignty uh, movement grew and was based. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, um, what WM can do, and suggests is the way forward, is for people that have got a like interest uh, in these kind of issues, uh, whether it be from a growing perspective uh, or from um, a campaigning point, we need to work together. There's no point in having lots of people uh, working on issues to do with uh, food production in the world and food consumption, and they're all doing it independently. Um, there are um, solutions around to the problem, and I think um, one of the issues in society, or the purpose of society, is to recognise what is good and to help that to flourish. Um, so that's really what I think we should be doing. Um, we've been hearing about the cafe and the real food, the real junk food project, which is a good thing, which needs to flourish. Um, there are campaigns that take place from a campaigning point of view, but there are lots of individual issue uh, initiatives in Leeds, in Zimbabwe, um, and throughout the world. A part of the task, I believe, is to link uh, the good practice and good projects that take place so they, they enable um, the world to flourish more rather than, as it sometimes seems to do, um, descend into more and more <coughs> chaos. Um, just in terms of uh, other resources to kind of um, finish, um, WDM has produced further uh, materials, for example the one here on food sovereignty. Uh, it has been campaigning uh, against um, the fact that in Ghana uh, there are possibilities in the very near future there will be laws to control the use of seed. Um, we believe that it's linked, the whole issues are linked to issues of justice. In fact, the World Development Movement is changing its name from next year to Global Justice Now. Um, however, food is an issue which pervades everybody. It's not just about campaigners, um, it's not just about uh, gardeners, it's not just about farmers, it pervades all of us as members of society and we should be trying, I believe, to work together to help uh, good food uh, production and use flourish. One of the ways that that can be done or is highlighted um, is on um, unexpected places. The BBC Radio 4 has a food programme and on that food programme you'll find highlighted many, many good uh, initiatives uh, around uh, in the food world, both in this country um, and elsewhere. And I've got a clip on there, but uh, I haven't got time to play it, just about the uh, slow food um, conference in 
uh, Italy has taken place recently. But there are many examples of good things going on. So I think um, being involved in these kind of issues is not about um, the downers uh, and the misery of the world. It's not just about those issues. It's about the good potential that there is in the world as well. Uh, and finally, that's a, a picture of, again, of a WDM meeting in London, uh, people sort of discussing and debating the issues of uh, food in the world and locally. So I'm going to talk about two quite different uh, projects. Uh, one is in the city of Leeds, called Feed Leeds, as the title quite clearly says. Uh, and the other is Barefoot Lightning, which is my company, which has been based out of India. And I, I've spent the last 10 years or so out in India, where we've been working a lot with smallholder farmers out there and looking at how we can use technology to change their lives and livelihoods. Um, it's given me an interesting perspective on a lot of the Feed Leads projects. And my initial reaction was uh, to being asked to talk about Feed Leads and its relevance in Africa was that, that there is no relevance. Uh, just as the form of agriculture, the type of agriculture is just so completely different. And the, the challenges in the cities are also very, very different. But having thought about it a bit more and gone through, I, I think I'll try and draw out some ideas that, that can be of some use, at least, uh, in, in Africa. Um, for the first thing about feed leads, and I don't expect you to read this, the point is it's a group of different groups. Some of them are NGOs, some of them are companies, a number are lead city council. And lots of these groups have come together with the idea of there must be a more sustainable way for people in Leeds to get their food. Some of that is about growing, about urban agriculture. Some of that is about food projects, and uh, we were quite privileged to see the real f junk food project right from its inception at the beginning. Uh, and we also saw some challenges, because we couldn't really help. And so some of the things we had to do was try and put things in place to help projects like the real junk food project. Um, that there are also, if, if you go to the website, there are... Uh, a lot of interactive websites where people can actually put a place map to say we have a project here and so some of these are about different growing areas, different allotments in the city. Uh, some of them, even there is another layer that talks about trees where you can go for wild harvest. So there is a fruit tree where you can go and you can pick your own. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that, but it, it's interesting to explore, and as you mag magnify up, you can see more and more things near to you. Uh, there is also a calendar of events on there, so, so uh, and if you look, there are quite a number of events happening on each day, and, uh, and again, this is all community-driven, it's not managed by an individual, all the different members put their information in one place for the community as a whole to find out. The structuring I was talking about, though, we, we had to spend a lot of time thinking about how do we represent projects in, in a city, in, in an urban area like Leeds, and how do we actually consolidate and bring those together? Because some of those projects, if we're talking to government uh, about projects in the city, they're important, but actually they really have no relation with us, some of those projects. So it's important to know about them, to put a stake in the ground, but, but actually, we, we need to give them a title. So, so those were, in effect, aligned projects because they share a similar focus. And it just gave us a, a lexicon, a way of talking about these different types of projects. Uh, then you have associated projects where we have groups that actually you know, might come to us for some advice or some support. So we might not be very deeply involved. Um, but then with co-managed projects, and, and these are some of the big ones where we put a lot of effort, there might be one institution or group leading that, but a lot of committee member time put forward. And so one of these is a Leeds food strategy, which is trying to bring together all of these things in the city. I'm going to talk about some of the others, like Lesson and Leeds Edible Campus as we go through. So ed edible gardens is one of the areas now where, where, where actually there potentially is something interesting that can be learned and shared with Africa. Um, first project I just want to talk to is uh, about gardening. And this is about building awareness of growing food in your garden. So instead of actually 
growing flowers uh, in the front garden and having a pretty garden, the idea is actually instead of having your vegetable patch at the back of the garden, put it at the front so that people can see and start to re-engage with food growing in the city. Uh, and again, it's something that can or can't work in, uh, in other countries, but it's about generating awareness in this particular area. Uh, there's another project um, uh, called Incredible Edible, which uh, started out of Todmorden. Uh, and what happened here was this was incorporating the local <coughs> council and a lot of people and taking borders at the side of the, the road and growing food in those borders. Uh, and the purpose of that w was actually, uh, again, to show we can grow food here, but, but to let anybody take it. So anybody that wants food can go to those areas and pull up the food. <coughs> and that had some other knock-on impacts in, in terms of... Um, Antisocial behaviour in the city actually, well, in the town, dropped significantly with this engagement of the local community. Um, there are other things. This is the Leeds Edible Campus, and the reason I wanted to share this particular one is an area that, again, in a lot of urban areas, roof gardens are something we're just looking into right now, but not really doing much in Leeds. But Roof gardens in a lot of developing countries are a potentially very good way to use an urban area for food production. Um, Leeds City Council um, has been getting more and more involved now with Feed Leeds. They initially started it and then there was a period where there was limited engagement, but now the engagement is very strong again. So we are working on a food strategy, as I mentioned. But the other thing that started happening again is outside um, the, the Civic Hall, uh, there were food, well, flower beds that actually were food beds, but, but actually were quite pretty. And if you look, you, you can actually make these things quite appealing and attractive. Uh, and again, the public parks, de or the parks, uh, I forget the exact name, the parks department, grow a lot of seeds now and instead of doing flower seeds they've started converting to vegetable and uh, fruit seeds and now the, the, there's a much bigger engagement to grow seedlings to hang out to different hand out to different groups if need be. Uh, lesson is Leeds Edible School Sustainability Network and this is a, one that I think is particularly interesting. In the Leeds area it's a lot about re-engaging with sustainability and growth um, but, but for me, uh, I had a very interesting um, experience when I was in India. It is that I spoke to one of the heads of agriculture extension in one of the states in India. It was Haryana. And wheat production had gone up as a result of the Green Revolution, but tail had often started to dip back down. And the, the, the guy brought all his team in and said, look, everybody says you're invisible, you're not there, you don't do any work. What happens if I don't send you out on your day job and give you something else to do instead? What should you do? And actually what he decided to do was to send all his extension officers to the schools. Tell the kids in those schools, okay, for this wheat crop, what, what your family should be doing now is this. And actually they went from having complaints about having no impact on agriculture to have parents complaining that they get pestered by the kids until they do what's been said to be done. So, so, so actually the, the integrating at the school systems can be very, very powerful both over here and in developing countries. Um, I'm just going to skip through those. Um, the, the final thing I, I just wanted to talk about in uh, the, the Feed Leads Network is the Permaculture Association. Uh, I, I don't know if you know what permaculture is about, but it's about permanent agriculture is the way they frame the name. And, and what it is, it's a very mixed cropping system. So it's about taking multiple different plants and putting them in a balanced ecosystem. Uh, and what that does is it drives a lot more resilience. So, so if you have some different depths of roots, you're pulling water from different levels of the soil. Uh, you have less chance of having a disease or a pest infestation decimate your whole production. And the relevance here is for things like kitchen gardens to just feed, feed a household. Okay. So I'm going to stop there on the feed leads part and just transfer to the other presentation.
Uh, and just tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing using ICT to try and transform agriculture. And we've been driving this out of India, but we've been doing a lot of work now to look at expanding to other countries. Um, just quickly, the name, it's a bit strange, but it comes from barefoot scientists. These are people who go out in the field with farmers with no shoes because they're walking through the flooded paddy field or otherwise that brings science into the grasp of farmers and really bring it down to earth. And lightning was just about something big, powerful and intense to cause a lot of change. In terms of what we've done, we, oops, let me move that. we've had experience across a number of different and diverse agro-ecosystems and a number of different crops. So we've done a combination of IT projects with consulting projects so that we could really understand the challenges on the ground. We've also worked with small marginal farmers and very small scale infrastructure on farms right the way up to industry and government sector. So we've seen the, the, the challenges at all different levels. Uh, and we've started by actually producing very simple instructional aids that were very visual as a basis for building our technology platforms. This is a project in particular we did. We built a pest and disease surveillance system for the government of India and this was about understanding how to create an agro-ecosystem balance. So if you have pests in a field, it, it doesn't mean you have a problem. They're only really pests if they grow out of control. Uh, and what you need to do, you need to understand the balance between the beneficial insects and the pests in the ecosystem. Uh, and if those things are in balance, you don't actually need to do anything. So, so a big part of the education here is how do I count and do a self-assessment and give myself confidence that actually I don't need to take any action just because I've seen something. How do we actually get this into the hands of farmers? We, we, we actually have to look at how we engage across a number of different areas. What are the problems that farmers have? They need to select a crop to grow. They need to understand what variety is worth growing or appropriate for them. They want to understand where they can get the best market price, what inputs to use, how much to use. So there are all these different challenges, uh, and actually figuring out an answer to these different challenges is what we've been doing through the technology. One of the keys to this, though, is that we, we have to actually localize things. So if, if you're in a hill station, as a cloud comes up a hill, it releases its rain. The other side, you, you have a rain shadow, so you get far less rain. So the conditions, plus if I have a flooded field or a dry bed field, the conditions in that field are very, very different. So the, the practices, the advisories for a farmer need to be completely individualized. I'm just going to skip through a few of these because I'm running down on time. This is just the, some of the science behind how we make this work. Uh, but in terms of the products and the platforms that we actually have on the ground, we, we, our main focus is one on a farmer, which is a sort of consumer product, if you like, and the other which is for extension workers, which is a professional product. The consumer product, we started designing this in the days before smartphones existed. Uh, but, but we designed it to be very, very visual to take care of literacy issues. And, and indeed, once, once we'd done that, we put text back in to try and aid literacy growth, because if I hear it and I see it, I can start to learn. We also have background behind each of the icons, so if you see it and you can't understand, you can click and hold and you actually will get a little voiceover or a video or a, an image plus an audio to explain what that's about. If we look at the extension side, there are different formats, but, but one of the things that we can use here are tablets in order to have a bigger sharing information channel, if you like. So, so it becomes something that you can pass around when you're having a, a meeting in a village. This, this is actually a meeting we went to for a, an inputs company where they were giving advisories for farmers how to grow in the local area. Uh, and this is some of the, the more detailed information you can start to put behind in a very structured fashion so that farmers can start to learn actually what's really important to me and what should I know about these different pests or diseases or varieties, etc. Uh, don't need to focus there. I, I think that's uh, my time is up. So thank you. Very much.